Hello, everybody. You are listening to the Sinister Story Hour, a podcast brought to you by the Western Skies Podcast Network. Here we discuss a new case each week. We talk about crime, cults, conspiracies, and all things sinister. If you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, and leave us a five star review. You can find us on Instagram and TikTok at Sinister Story Hour and on Twitter at Sinister Hour. You can also help support the show for as little as 99 cents per month. As always, thank you for listening, and let's jump in. Hey guys, have you thought about making your own podcast, but you're not really sure where to start? That's how I was at first, and really the only choice that stood out to me was Anchor. And let me tell you why. It was completely free to start, and it has all the tools that allow me to record and edit my podcast right from my phone or computer. And they distribute the podcast for me, so it's heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. There's no minimum listenership, and you can start making money from day one. And really, everything you need to make your podcast is all in one place. I love it, and I know you will too. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Sinister Story Hour with Steph. Thank you so much for joining me. And I just first of all want to say I'm sorry for the small break that I took. It was not intentional, but due to illnesses and other things going on in the family, I just was not able to record for a little bit. But I am back and I do have one heck of an episode for you. So if you have not heard about Dennis Nielsen, you will definitely be shocked by this story and definitely be surprised that you haven't heard of him before. I had heard of him, but I didn't know all of the details until I actually delved into this, and this is quite a case. So we will get into the story, and again, thank you so much for joining me. Dennis was born in 1945 in Scotland. His parents divorced in 1948, but his father, who was a Norwegian soldier that had traveled to Scotland, was hardly ever around. Dennis would go on to be one of Britain's most notorious and prolific serial killers. He was known as the Muswell Hill Murderer or the Kindly Killer. Growing up, it doesn't seem like Dennis was close to anyone except for his maternal grandfather. Even though Dennis was only five years old, he would later recall that he would take walks with his grandpa, and he would recall that as one of the happiest moments of his life. He would also go on to describe his grandfather as being his quote, great hero and protector, end quote. His grandpa was a fisherman at sea, and his health had been declining for a while, but he had kept working due to obligations. While he was out at sea one time, he had a heart attack and he died. Dennis was only six years old when that actually happened. Dennis would later recall that his mom was weeping when he returned home from school that day, and she asked him if he would want to go see his grandpa. And of course, Dennis was super excited, and yes, I want to see my grandpa, because he didn't understand, being six years old, that something had happened. And so his mom actually led him into the room, and there is his grandpa lying in an open coffin in the house. And his mother would describe to Dennis that his grandpa was just sleeping and had gone to a better place. And psychologists actually would later say that that deeply affected Dennis. And it affected how he would associate later love and death together. And we can kind of see that connection later on. When he would mention it to his mom, she just continued to say, don't worry about him. He's in a better place. And it just seems like he began this fascination with death, even that young. Um, After the death of his grandfather, Dennis would become way more withdrawn. He would visit the harbor alone and he would watch the boats. And at home, he would rarely take part in any activities with the family. He didn't like affection from his other family members. He did not like hugs or any sort of affection from his grandma or his mom. And he went on to later resent his mom and his grandmother for the attention that they would display toward the siblings, which had to be hard because even when they were trying to give him attention, he wasn't wanting it. Later, he would grow to feel that he had some jealousy toward his stepdad and his siblings because of all of the 
affection that they they were able to get. And later in life, he would actually grow to respect his stepdad. He would visit the beach himself as he was growing up, and he would lie on the shore, letting the water carry him out just a little bit every now and then, and kind of would go farther and farther with it. And at one point, he actually almost drowned doing this, but he would later recall that that was the closest experience that he ever felt to his grandpa after he died. And so you can kind of see that connection as well with the feeling of death and that euphoria that he was getting by um, pretending to be drowning and, and actually almost drowning that time. Growing up, Nilsson knew that he was different and he knew from a rather young age that he was gay. He would keep it hidden. It was very different time and um, a lot of stigmas associated with being gay and he didn't want to deal with that. He was afraid of that as well and so he kept that very hidden and it became a source of shame and confusion for Dennis. He would describe later that he was actually at one point fondled as a child by an older boy, and he stated that he didn't find it unpleasant. So he was very confused, even at this age, of his feelings, and and he knew that even though that shouldn't have happened to him, that he was a victim of that assault, he didn't really know what his feelings toward it were, because in a sense, he felt actually excited by it. Dennis's brother suspected for a long time that he was gay, and he would actually ridicule him in public, which I think just made it even more dramatic. It made it even harder for Dennis to deal with, and so I can't imagine having to deal with the the stigma of that and knowing that you're different and knowing that, that your family is not going to be accepting of you. Dennis joined the Army at age 16, and he did there feel the same, just different from the other kids. He definitely stood out among the other kids. His intelligence was far above average, and so he did stand out in the intelligence aspect as well. In the army, he became a cook and a butcher, and that was a skill that unfortunately would come in handy in his future as a serial killer. When he was in the army, Dennis wouldn't shower with the other boys because he was afraid of becoming aroused. And so he would pretty much isolate himself and not really fully engage with the other boys in a lot of ways, I think. Um, They also recalled that he wanted to control everything. Uh, Photography became kind of a way to control situations for him. And he would manipulate photographs to where it would look like there were people that had maybe passed away in the photograph or um, there were certain poses that he would do that would make it look like somebody was actually dead in the photograph. After leaving the army, Dennis took some police training and there his fascination with death would just really flourish even more. He loved at that time visiting morgues and bodies And um, after autopsy, they would get to go and see the bodies. And he just loved that whole process. And so it just became even more of a fascination for him at that point. At one point, Dennis is hired as a civil servant. And he would actually remain working there until his arrest. He was eventually promoted into a supervisory role. And so he worked there for quite a few years, and he was a supervisor at the time that he was arrested. There weren't a whole lot of actual relationships that Dennis had and could count. David Galachan and Dennis lived together for 18 months, and they actually shared a dog. This would be the the closest thing to a relationship that Dennis would ever come to as far as a long-term relationship. And Dennis would recall it fondly, but <clears throat> Galachan would go on to deny that they were in a sexual relationship, but Dennis did talk about the, the sexual relationship that they had, and although he said that it was very rare that they did have 
some sort of sexual intimacy that it was happening. And we do know they were together for that period of time and they were sharing the house. During that time, there are a lot of videos online that you can find where uh, David Galichan is actually taking videos of Dennis and he is very particular about how he wants things, how he wants the video to look, how he wants David to film it. And you can just tell from the video that Dennis is a very controlling person to David. And that's eventually what broke up the relationship. Uh, Dennis was very, very controlling and just really mean to David in these videos. He just really puts him down a lot and does not talk very nicely to him. Um, he definitely is not nice to him and he's very demeaning. So I get the impression that David just up and left because of that, because he finally couldn't take it. After David left, Dennis had kind of a friends with benefits named Martin, and Martin actually is in some interviews about Dennis, and he talks about Dennis and how controlling he was and how if he didn't get his way, he would just keep pestering you until you finally gave in. And so there were times that Martin was not giving his consent to having a sexual relationship but Dennis would keep pestering and keep bugging him until he would finally give in. And so he talks about that, about how he just had a way of getting his own way and pushing his own will onto you. Dennis during this time would also visit gay pubs and he would have very casual encounters with men, but it always left him feeling even more empty afterwards. So he was never quite satisfied. He never could fill that void of having somebody that would be constantly with him. Now, before we get into Dennis's crimes, I'd like to take a quick ad break. And I also want to give you a quick reminder that this is going to get pretty gruesome and pretty rough in the second part. So if you're not up for that, I completely understand. But this is probably the time to drop out. So we will return after a quick ad break. Dennis's first victim was a 14-year-old, Stephen Holmes. They actually met at a gay pub, which just seems odd to me that at 14 years old, this is during the 70s in London, and they met at a gay pub, but for him to be 14 is just a very young age. Dennis ended up taking him back home, and Stephen was never seen alive again. According to most accounts, the next morning, when Dennis realized that the boy would be leaving soon, he was overcome with a feeling of dread and a desire to keep him from leaving. And in order to keep him there with him, Dennis strangled him with a tie, and then he drowned his head in a bucket of water. After that, he took the corpse to the bathroom, washed it carefully, and placed it back into his bed, which is why the name The Kindly Killer comes up because he was just very meticulous with the corpses. While he's trying to get rid of the evidence and trying to get rid of the blood and everything, he's also taking such a meticulous care of each corpse. He would later state how beautiful he found the corpse to be. He attempted to have sex with the corpse this time, but he was not successful. And at one point, he actually hid it under his floorboards for a period of about seven months. After that, he removed the corpse to burn the remains in his back garden. His second victim was 20-year-old Ken Okenden. Ken and Dennis spent the day together sightseeing and drinking, which ended back at Dennis's apartment. As he began to feel the fear of Ken leaving and that dread of being alone, Dennis once again strangled the man this time with an electrical cord, and he went through the same routine of cleaning it and sharing the bed with the corpse. This time, he would take photos performing sexual acts and things like that, and just photos that would display him with the corpse and displaying the corpse as it was laid out on his bed. And he would eventually um, go on to 